Leia here from LeiaForSci.com and in this video we'll look at how the swap method will help you find RNS for tricky molecules when priority group number 4 is not in the back or facing forward. You can find this entire video series along with my practice quiz and cheat sheet by visiting my website LeiaForSci.com slash chirality. In the past videos I showed you how to rank priority groups and I also showed you how to find the RNS configuration when priority group number 4 was in the back so that we cross it out, trace from 1 to 2 to 3, and in this case we have S. Then I showed you how to find RNS if priority group number 4 is facing forward. In this case you approach it the same way, but then you reverse it so that S becomes R and R becomes S since you're looking at it backwards. But now what do you do if priority group number 4 is not facing towards the back so you can trace 1 to 2 to 3, it's not facing forward so that you can flip it, how do you approach it now? Your professors may teach you to redraw the molecule, which works, except that it wastes time and causes a lot of doubt on your exams because you're not always sure how to flip the molecule and if you did it right. On exams, you can't afford that kind of doubt. Some professors will even allow you to use a model kit, which works, except that you have to waste time building the kit, figuring out which substituent is what, and that is also going to waste time and cause doubt. You can't afford that either. So what you can do on exams, and what is guaranteed to save you 5, 10, or even 15 minutes and avoid any confusion is the swap method. The swap method relies on your understanding of the most basic principles of chirality and identifying enantiomers and recognizing that a pair of enantiomers are the same exact molecule except that they are the reverse, the mirror image of each other, meaning that their groups are oriented in the opposite direction. Here we have two chiral molecules. I put one on a gray center and one on a black center so we can tell them apart. But notice that they have four unique substituents each. And since they're perfectly superimposable, they're the same exact thing, right? They have the same chirality, same substituents, same everything. What we're going to do here is use the gray one as a reference. And then we'll take this molecule and grab any two random substituents. I don't care which ones they are because it's about the fact that we're swapping them rather than what we're swapping. We just did one swap, now let's see what happened. If we try to superimpose them, it doesn't work. The white and red are perfectly superimposable, but the green and the blue are opposites. In fact, if I put them side by side and attempt to see a mirror between them, look at that, they're perfect enantiomers of each other. So we took a molecule that was exactly the same, swapped two random substituents, and we got the enantiomer. Since we're using the gray one as a reference, let's put it down, and now we'll swap any two other random substituents. It doesn't matter what we swap second in reference to what we swapped first. Now let's see if we can still have that mirror between the two. We can't. The blue and white are mirrored, the green and red are not. Now what happens if I try to superimpose them? Look at that, they're perfectly superimposable. We started with a molecule, did one swap to get the enantiomer, but when we did a second swap, we're back to the same exact configuration. Two swaps brought us back to the initial chirality. Let's put a reference down, and we'll randomly do a third swap. As I do this, I want you to predict what we're going to see. One swap gave us the enantiomer, two gave us the same thing. Three swaps, well, can we superimpose them? Looks like we can't. Red and green are lined up, blue and white are not. But if we try to put a mirror between them, they're perfect mirror images of each other. So three swaps gave us an enantiomer. What do you think will happen if I do a fourth swap? Again, I'm choosing substituents at random because it's about the fact that we swap rather than what we swap. Four swaps. Let's try to do that mirror again. And it doesn't work. The blue and green are mirrored, the white and red are not. So let's try to superimpose them. And look at that. Four swaps, exactly the same chirality. They are perfectly superimposable. 
So let's quickly review what we saw. When we had one swap, we got an enantiomer. When we did two swaps, we got the same exact configuration. If we did three swaps, we got the enantiomer. And when we did four swaps, we got the same exact thing. If I were to continue this pattern and let's say have 27 swaps, once again, I would expect to have the enantiomer. If I had enough time and patience to do 5,736 swaps, once again, I would get the same exact thing. And that's because, as you saw, it didn't matter which groups I took, it only mattered the number of times that I broke and swapped bonds. So if I do any odd number of swaps, I will get the enantiomer of the molecule I started with. And if I do any even number of swaps, I'm going to get the same exact configuration of the chiral molecule that I started with. Odd gives me the enantiomer, and even gives me the same exact thing. Let's prove this with a very simple example. Remember that we rank according to atomic number. If you haven't memorized the atoms that I have on the cheat sheet, I'll let you follow along real quick. Over here, we have HCNOF, then phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, where iodine is the highest and hydrogen is the lowest. We're ranking a chlorine, bromine, hydrogen, and carbon. Chlorine, bromine, hydrogen, carbon. Bromine is the highest priority, followed by chlorine, followed by carbon, and hydrogen is the lowest priority. Step one, prioritize. Step two, ensure number four is in the back. We are good to go. Step three, cross it out. Step four, trace an arc from one to two to three. In this case, we get S. What I have here is the same exact molecule. But now what I want to do is take any two random substituents and swap them. We just want one swap from the original and we want to see if that comes out to be R or S. So I will randomly swap the methyl group with a bromine. We'll put a CH3 down here and a BR up here. Keep track of the swaps by writing swaps and just one. One is odd. We expect it to be the enantiomer Let's prove it. Bromine 1, chlorine 2, methyl 3, hydrogen 4. Cancel out number 4. Trace a path from 1 to 2 to 3, and lo and behold, we have R. We did one swap and we got R, where our starting molecule was S. Let's do this again. First we'll number, we have bromine 1, chlorine 2, methyl 3, hydrogen 4. We'll keep track of our swaps on the side, and Let's just do two swaps, and we want to prove that an even number of swaps gives me the same exact chirality. It doesn't matter what I switch. For the first swap, I'll go ahead and switch bromine and chlorine, so that I have bromine number one on the right, chlorine number two on the left. That's one swap. For the second swap, I'll swap methyl and bromine, so that I have CH3 number three coming out of the page, and I have bromine number one up in the plane of the page. Two swaps, that's an even number. That means I should have the same exact chirality as this molecule. I expect it to be S. Number four is in the back. We cross it out, trace a path from one to two to three, and look at that, we have S. The molecule looks completely different from what I started, but because I did two swaps, I retained the chirality, and once again, I have S. But this was a simple molecule. Group number four was a hydrogen. Hydrogen was in the back. How does this work in real life when you have a molecule where group number four is not in the back and not in the front so you can reverse it? Let's go back to our initial example and see how to solve that. I'm going to draw it twice because I want to show you a trick that once you get it, makes it even simpler. We've already prioritized the groups. So what we want to do now is keep track of the swaps. Anytime you're doing swaps, you want to follow these rules. Swap number one is to put group number four in the back because the reason for setting it up the way we do is having number four out of the way and ranking one to two to three. If number four is not in the front or the back, the first swap, the entire purpose of swapping is getting that in the back so that we can prioritize everything else around it. 
but doing that one swap is an odd number. It gives us an enantiomer. And if you're anything like me where you're absent-minded and you'll do step one, get so excited, forget about step two, you're going to lose points. So step two or swap number two is to add a second swap, any other swap other than number four, because that has to stay in the back. And you do that second swap to get a total even number so that your chirality stays the same. So let's start by putting number four in the back. We'll swap the hydrogen with a group that happens to be in the back. So we have hydrogen on dashes and OH up in the plane. That's my first swap, keep track of it. For the second swap, I need to undo the enantiomer. I need a total even number of swaps and I can do anything at random. I can swap the Cl and the CH3. I can swap the Cl and the OH. It doesn't matter. You don't believe me? Try it both ways and check both ways. You'll see it's the same. In this case, we have a CH3 moved left and a chlorine that moved right. But we just lost all the numbers. So what we have to do is put the numbers back based on the priority that you see. Chlorine is still number one. OH is still number two. Methyl is number three. Hydrogen is number four. We have a total of two swaps. That's an even number. That means the chirality is the same as what we started. But now, hydrogen number four is in the back. We cross it out trace the path from one to two to three it goes towards the left counterclockwise and we know that our molecule is s we didn't build a model kit we didn't try to rotate it in our brains or on paper we simply went by the enantiomer principle or the number of swaps and we got s but if you look at this it starts to get messy especially when you're dealing with more complex molecules so an even simpler way to do this is to pay attention to what happened when we moved hydrogen to this position, we then had to prioritize hydrogen and we got a number four in that spot. The purpose of swapping was to move the numbers so that we can prioritize numbers. So at the end of the day, does it matter if I move the atom or just the number that came with the atom? When your molecules are bigger, it gets so much easier to just focus on the numbers and nothing else. I want to show you how this works on the molecule on the right. Once again, I'll keep track of my swaps because number four is up and that doesn't help me. For the first swap, I need to put number four in the back. So all I'm swapping are the numbers, not the atoms. I'm not saying that OH is priority number four. I'm not saying that hydrogen is priority number two. I am simply swapping the numbers, keeping in mind that I would have swapped the atoms with it, but I'm saving time. That was swap number one. That's odd. It's an enantiomer. We can't stop here. We have to swap again. The second swap we had done was for the two lower groups. So here I'll swap just the number one with the number three, placing the number one to the right, the number three on the left. Keep track, two swaps, that's an even number, should have the same exact chirality. And looking at just the numbers, cross that number four, trace the path from one to two to three. And just like in the previous version, we have S without having taken the time to swap all the atoms themselves. And a question I often get is, okay, so do I have to swap the first two and the next two? No. Why did I swap number four and number two first? Number four had to go to the back. Number two happened to be in the back. That is why I had to do that as my first swap. The second swap, why did I choose these two? Because I felt like it. I could have chosen any other groups to swap as long as once four is in the back I don't touch it because the principle is the same just like you saw with the model kit it didn't matter which substituents I grabbed which color I grabbed as long as I swapped any two an odd number of times I got the enantiomer any substituents for an even number of swaps gave me the same exact thing and this also works for molecules that are written in line structure, chair conformation, cyclohexane, Newman projection, Fisher projections, anything. The principles apply everywhere. So for example, if I give you a molecule that looks like this, where I have a methoxy coming forward and an OH going to the back, the first thing I want to do is rank my substituents. If you're not comfortable ranking when you have the same atom on both sides but then they differ, make sure you see the next video which shows you how to rank longer chains. For this molecule, methoxy is number one, hydroxy is number two, and that's because methoxy is OC, hydroxy is OH, C outranks H. Then on the top, I have an isopropyl 
which is going to rank number three, and the ethyl ranks number four. That's because both carbons are outranked by both oxygens, but the carbon with two carbons attached, the isopropyl, outranks carbon with one carbon attached, the ethyl. And once again, we have number four in the plane. It's now forward or back. The few seconds it takes you to write out the word swaps, A will avoid confusion, and B is still so much faster than whatever method your professor has been teaching you. For the first swap, I need to put number four in the back. So I will simply swap the number. I'm not even starting to redraw this chain. It's going to get so messy. All I swap is the number. I put number four on the dashes, putting it back, and number two where I grab the number four. So that's one swap. For the second swap, I can swap whatever, as long as I don't touch number four. So I'm going to choose to swap one and two. One goes on top, two goes on bottom. I have a total even number of swaps. That means the chirality is the same thing as what we started with, and we're good to go. Cancel out number four, trace the path from one to two to three, and our molecule is S. If you need help ranking molecules that are deeper with multiple atoms on the substituent, be sure to see the next video where we look at how to compare substituents that have the same starting atom, but then something changes down the line. If you feel confident with this information, be sure to try my stereochemistry practice quiz, which features medium to tricky questions to make sure you know all the tips and tricks to look out for. Consider yourself warned, it is not an easy quiz. You can find it along with the entire series and my stereochemistry cheat sheet by visiting my website, leaforsci.com chirality.